Regan. Yeah, no, I drive through Regan's all the time. Um, of course, on 95, you know, or down to Boise. So Regan's just like where you go in the spring. It's really? Spring what? And to go do like not whitewater rafting yet then at that time? No, you could, you could cross the river and be in the sand forest. It's Got nice. it. That's like awesome. Yeah. That's all. I, I, for whatever reason, I didn't know you were from McCall. It always sticks in my mind that your daughter was in Fort Collins, like doing yeah. something there. But that you're from McCall, it's cool. Yeah, McCall's beautiful. We were in McCall in May. Yeah. We have fam a kind of family, people that are not related to us, but kind of like cousins who are in Boise and they have a timeshare in McCall. And we were up there. I'm, nice. so I'm glad, dude. No, I'm not going to lie. If you, no, if you, if you stay, if you stay, uh, if you stay informally and just do your, even just practice your speech for tomorrow, that you're, you're just here physically. It's awesome. It's the numbers up for the class. Um, okay, everyone, welcome to uh, Maple Syrup number 237, episode three of Catholicism and Disasters. All week this week is the Black Plague. Today is the Feast of St. Augustine. I think Mass is still probably going on. I bet it's a longer Mass, which is really nice. You know, Feast Day of our patrons, so people are kind of making their way over. There's no hurry. I'm going to get my coffee. We'll probably actually get under it's two twelve or six. We'll probably get underway at twelve eleven. I don't know. More people start filing in, and you know what? If it's just the three of us, then you can read the board. All my friends are here. All the important people are here. Poor guy. You know, um, poor guy, lucky guy. I'm a very lucky guy to have you guys in my class. But anyways, I'm turning the lights on. It's kind of too dark. Uh, probably right. I'm gonna get coffee and then. Let's just let's do it. What do you guys think? Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. So I'll be right back. But you're still recording, so we can't really talk. You didn't have to like look. I love it. There's always kind of giving in the background noise. Commentary or whatever, you know, that's awesome. Please talk away. Do we have a new intern again? John. Uh, oh, yeah. Good. It's a nice day. All of that is a nice day. How's Andrew saying? Yeah, he's back. Mm -hmm. Just for him. He was super. Yeah. Was, this like Joe was super you. Well. Matt yeah. was super John. <laughs> um, I don't know. He's in the room. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll post flashes. It's a lady. And it's called the Virgin of Prayer. I actually can't read that from here. <laughs> um, Do you have a question? It's from the National Art Gallery in London. Maybe not this exact one. <laughs> um, so you don't know what you're doing? No. Okay. Let me see here. Um, I, we have a. Hmm. This pamphlet of Our Lady of Fatima. An interesting thing about people don't know. Most depictions of Our Lady of Fatima have the star of Esther on the bottom of her robe here. It's a reference, like the link between Our Lady and Esther applies to. What is the star of Esther? Have you heard of the star of Esther? No. Yeah. So maybe you don't know all things during the central reading. Mm. Desgraciadamente, yo no sabe nunca. Yo estoy un hombre muy estúpido. Y especialmente algo, algo que mi esposa no gusta, no gusta de nunca es cuando yo traté de hablar español con mi acento. Mi esposa 
piensa que es más fuerte, no es, no es actual, no es como las personas de, de verdad que vienen de México, de otras partes de Latinoamérica, habla, es, es artificialmente, como se dice. Todo simplemente no es bueno, pero para mí es algo bueno. Ryan Alexander, este hombre habla español um, casi mental perfecto. Casi mental perfecto. Sí. Sí, pero hablo italiano. No, 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 Veramente tú, tú hablas italiano. ¿Por qué? ¿Cuándo tú vas a imparar italiano? Yo he hablado italiano questo punto por sé sé sí 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 I was going on. Do you have three? Sí, sí. Bueno. You were the one who said it. I said it. Sí, sí, sí. Bueno. Back, back, Schmidt. Bueno. Pues. Questo libro è simile, simile di uh, lingua latina per seguito. Mm. Se okay. Ha capito, sì, sí, bueno. Um, All right, no more time. Well, no, so, fun, yeah, it's almost as fun for us to listen to as you <laughs> No more trying to communicate with Italian and Spanish. Clay Zimmerman. Yeah. Quando io hablo espanol. Yeah. Um, algo me venga en mente inmediatamente que tú eres un hombre más guapo del mundo. No. Tú eres un hombre más guapo, más inteligente. Yo estoy feliz que tú eres um, con nosotros hoy. Gracias, gracias. gracias. Y Becca Schmidt, Becca Schmidt también. Becca Schmidt, yo prometo a Becca Schmidt um, muchas veces a, a, a um, imparar, no imparar, a aprender, aprende um, el idioma sí. alemán. No puedo, no puedo hacer eso. Es más difícil para mí. Y lo siento mucho. Um, is everyone can read on the board, right? <laughs> um, all my friends are here with me. I am so grateful that Becca Schmidt and, and Clayton Zimmer are here today. I want to go nuts. I want to go insane. I want to throw tables. I want to flip tables. I'm like, so, um, Becca, I honestly, I seriously, thank you for being here. This is freaking awesome. I'm so glad you're here, Clay. The fact that you're here is also just freaking amazing. Um, looks like you're wearing a hat that promotes your, your business. It's freaking cool. That's real promotion. Yeah. No, see, it's not even it's not even self promotion. It's like it's like um, people will always wear like a John Deere hat or whatever, and they don't ever like utilize that which is on their head. I don't know. I like maybe it. the guys that wear that have the name John Deere. Maybe I don't know. The John Deere yeah, hat. but see, but you're doing this. I'm saying it's awesome, guys. I think Matt just let out. But it's again 12 15. If people are going to come, they can come. We can just get started. So, especially for the incomparable and very, very cool. And Drew's new as well. Everyone's new today. There's a lot of cool people there. This is awesome, guys. Man, I wish we could like unite universes right now because there's new people today. And last time there's 11 other people. If all people will be here, it'd be a nice full classroom. But, you know, you know, a guy can dream. So, last class, all we did, and remember again, if any of you are interested, I'm not saying that you would be, but if you are interested, remember all this stuff is online. And you're just very, very welcome to email me. I'll send you the link. The previous two classes, the two of you, the three of you, you're coming at the right time. All we did in the previous classes was cover the syllabus and go over the topics, which is kind of duh, fine. And last class was the earthquake of Antioch. No big deal. Not as interesting as what we're going to talk about today. This week is the Black Plague over two parts. Hello, hello, guys. Hi, hello. Um, all the new faces I brought. You what? I brought all the new faces for You do not get responsibility for Becca Schmidt. She is a veteran in spot. How dare you? No. Clayton Zimmerman, this guy too. Like no one, no one tells him he's his own man. No one tells him what to do. No, Trish said they were uh, I don't know. Is Trish coming? Where's Trish? 
Where is your mom and dad? Where are they? Stay. Wow. So they choose, they choose, as St. Paul said, you know, uh, athletic training is of limited value. Keyword limited. That they're doing limited instead of doing electrical training, right? Right now, Xander knows what's up. Right now, Xander hits a thousand pound deadlifts and he rolls out of bed. Then he's done for the day. That's all he does. We're going to get through just probably the kind of basic information on the black plague today. And then next class on Wednesday, go over the real kind of in-depth Catholic reaction. Okay. So without further ado, who can talk to me about the Black Plague? What do you know about the Black Plague? I'm going to make this as basic as possible. And we might, you know, retrod, well-trodden ground. That's fine. But I always like to know, like, I assume all of you are very smart people. I assume that you know something about it. Maybe not. Does anyone know when it happened? What's the deal? What's going on? What is the Black Plague? Can I start with the, with the Christian response to it? Pre You're going to start with that. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Instead of, because I don't know dates and things, but priests actually went out into afflicted areas to give last rites, to give comfort, to give aid, unlike a more recent new episode that we had. Um, and masses continued. And so the Christian response was instead of hiding and running, we make God present to those in need. We're going to talk about the Catholic response to COVID at the end of the semester. Does anyone have comments on that? Marie has comments. She shared them. Anyone want to share? The Catholic response to COVID was very good. It was very lacking. It was whatever. What do you think? Marie, I would chalk her up in the box. Didn't like the Catholic response. <laughs> um, what do you guys think? Yeah, there was, a, there was an incident where we went to uh, um, to a church, which I guess will remain nameless. Um, and during the church is called Remain Nameless. If you come in here, we're not going to judge you. You're just a yeah. that's the name of the church, like Remain Nameless Congregation. Yes, yeah, so you come right. in, you know, you don't have to. Yeah, it was actually a woman's Got it. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> but it wasn't. No, you and I, and um, it was during COVID, and uh, we received on the tongue, and the priest wouldn't let us repeat on the tongue, so we went afterwards and sacristy and asked if we could receive, and he said. I'm not going to get sick on account of you two. Got and it. Um, we reminded him that there was uh, St. Damien of Molokai and the priest who, who got leprosy while, while treating lepers. And he said, well, then go find a leper company. Nice. The priest told us to go, me and my mom, to go. So do home. not tell me, I, I, again, I'm serious. I think that very serious, like how I need attraction. Thank you for keeping this all anonymous. I don't want to know who this is or whatever, but you did you have a previous relationship with this priest? No. You, no. Okay, God. Oh, God. Okay. Just interesting. Okay, Becca Schmidt, if you don't mind putting me on the spot. Again, I'm so glad you're here. I mentioned that. I'm super excited you're here. <laughs> what do you think? Just seriously, like, welcome to class. Break open a comment. Do you what do you, do you have any comments on the church response to COVID recently? Did you find it adequate, appropriate, not, or good? Why? Um, I think masses was valuable thing that happened this year. It's not So it was bad the response to the mass at distance on Zoom and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, another interesting thing, and um, there were priests who were sent to, um, I think it was Dachau, one of the, the camps, and they said mass in the, obviously not like scheduling with the guards, but like they said mass sort of under the table for the prisoners. So I think it's interesting that in Dachau you could go to mass and during COVID in Moscow, I know you couldn't. Sure. Well, I don't know. I kind of had my wedding upended by the whole COVID thing. You did really? When did you get when did you get married? Uh okay. we were gonna get married of 2020 or 2021. We're gonna get married in June that year. No, we're during the two churches response. They're very great. So what happened? Like you had a new setup. A lot of the Bishop of Wyoming it allowed 50 people to be in church until July. So I just stay on original schedule, and there's some other reasons we decided to move it forward six weeks. But got it. We wouldn't have been able to have more than 50 people there, so I only had 10 people already. Wow, wow. And uh, when I was working at St. Uh, St. Paul's down in Nampa, there was a similar circumstance to Maria Hunter's story where there's a priest who was filling in for the parish priest who was uh, there. Another priest came in, he called, he refused to, to you know, talk to people. Mm -hmm. Just by a cannonball. 
Yeah. Um, St. Paul's. I didn't know you were, I got married in St. Paul's, but old St. Paul's. I assume you worked at the new St. Paul's on Roosevelt Avenue, that new huge, the new huge St. Paul's, mm -hmm. right? St. Paul's in the, in the, the large one, right? Where it's like they're trying to do like a neo Gothic, whatever, Romanesque. Yeah. I got married in the old, super based old St. Paul's <laughs> that <laughs> is like mad, dilapidated in all the best ways. Man, it was awesome. It was great. Okay, so Clayton Zimmerman seems the only person in this class who cares about getting on topic. So there were things. He's not adding a single comment, rightfully so. His silence speaks volumes. Like, why are we talking about weddings and crap like this? <laughs> Thank you. No, really, thanks, really. The Black Death. Black Death. Since none of you people know when this took place, since none of you people had any idea, except for Meg Clark, she confirmed before class, she does know when it took place. No one else. Everyone's an idiot, except for her. Black Plague, 1347 to 1350. 1347 to 1350. Now, historians, social scientists, etc., the whole lot, archaeologists, whoever, all people who study this stuff, like literally every academic profession you can imagine, which speaking of, I had a funny moment. I was waiting for a class at WSU last week, and there's these two frat bros sitting there, and they were laughing so hard about this that I started laughing. It was awesome. We had a nice bonding moment. They were talking about some dumb, like, folk figure, Bruce Banner, the doctor. And the one guy said in some absurd voice, he's like, he has a PhD in every known discipline. They started dying laughing at how ridiculous that would be, that that could not be possible. So imagine, like, you know, every PhD, every discipline who studies the Black Plague says 1347 to 1350 is probably the kind of apex peak. And that's what we'll, what we'll get to today. But 1346, 53, blah, 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 there's always some kind of room, depending upon how you date it. Guys, mid 14th century. I have at least 22 points for you today. Here's point number one, 22 salient points to write down. Point number one is it is mid 14th century. Let's talk about what this means for the church. What's going on at this time? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas died in 1274. So Aquinas has been, Aquinas died not even 100 years ago, 80 years ago, or whatever. St. Francis of Sisi before him. Francis of Sisi dies in 1228. Um, the Crusades are wrapping up at this point. Crusades begin in 1095, 1099. They're wrapping up by 1291. This is post-Crusades, post-Aquinas and St. Francis of Assisi. We're not really at the Renaissance yet. Of course, that's another 100 years in the future. Late Middle Ages. Okay. Uh, everyone who was at Mass yesterday saw my speech about my upcoming epic poem inspired by Dante. Dante's Divine Comedy. It was written between 1308 and 1321 set in 1300 but so this is right after that that's the time period we're talking about catholic middle ages once more 1347 to 1350 it is the most fatal recorded pandemic in, in all of human history with estimates ranging from 75 to 200 million people killed not infected killed and in fact the population is so devastated may god rest all their souls it is so depressed so reduced by this it takes like a hundred years for the population of Europe to get back to pre-pandemic levels. We often think about population minus events like this, minus extinction events, nuclear, you know, world wars. Like Russia is a great example. I believe Russia has had a larger population in 1896 than does now. Well, because of the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin killed, you know, 60 million people on Stalin and right. So the, the population should be a certain um, thing, but it's not. The Black Plague is very much this. 1347 to 1350, Mauricio, welcome. You've come in, like your timing is absolutely just impeccable because you're here for the first fact. The Black Plague is 1347 to 50, 75 to 200 million people have died. What should that number tell you right away? Math people, <clears throat> 75 to 200 million. What, 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 am I, what am I getting at here? Why is that interesting? That the estimate is 75, 200 million people. Quite broad exactly. So there's still a lot unknown about this. There's still a lot about, gosh, you know, a city being ravaged and these plague doctors going out there long beaks, right? Kind of the most famous image, enduring image of this thing, which they did, by the way, for the smell mainly. These long beaks, they stuff with like flowers and perfumes to not smell the all the awful stuff. Apparently, when you popped with the bobble of this thing, it like smelled unbelievably bad. It's impossible to even describe. Imagine whatever you think is the worst smelling thing, like triple it, quadruple it. So it's large not even so much as a preventative for disease, although hopefully too, to prevent transmission, just so people could actually function. So they could like not pass out from, from the, the, you know, the foul smelling pus and all that kind of stuff. And um, we'll talk about symptoms and stuff and all that, you know, if you're like, well, what does that mean? We'll talk about that in a second. 
But this broad variance. Yeah, imagine if I told you, hey, Becca, um, we're going to do a road trip. Come meet us. Clay and I are going for a road trip. I want the rest of you guys to join us. Just drive, you know, 200 or 800 miles west. I don't know, like 200 miles north, whatever, 1,000 miles, right? That's not good directions. This is a huge variance here. You would think like, you know, between 77.3 and 78.1 million. That, that's a, Oh, that's a very precise number. 125 million people is the, is the, is the you know, plus or minus. It's insane. Well, a lot perhaps is unknown for how devastating this was. It's not simply this kind of stereotype of postmodern hubris. Well, they were just so dumb back then. Like, I think people back then were probably much smarter than we are. Um, that's my two cents, who cares opinion. It's not about intelligence or whatever. It's about accessibility to data when everyone is dead, including the data collectors in a whole city just coming ravaged. How do you count bodies? And you're not allowed to go, you shouldn't go count the bodies because you might get infected and, you know, whatever. In fact, a lot of the guys who serve as the grave diggers and people collecting the bodies to the towns are people who just developed the herd immunity. For whatever reason, thank God, they were immune. And But immune might be they almost died, right? This isn't like it was no big deal, but they, you know, pu puked their guts out and bled out and pus and everything, but they survived. Okay, so now you're probably pretty, you're probably good. You probably have immunity to this thing, and, and they would be the ones engaging in these activities. Most people, you know, even if they don't understand the transmission of this disease, are just kind of taking cover. So, yeah, there's large variance. No, is that figure for like just Western Christendom for Europe, or is that? We're just talking, yeah, it says here Western Eurasian, Western Eurasian, North Africa, but I'm mainly talking about Europe because we're talking about the plague getting into India as well. Yeah, 200, or, 75 to 200 million people Europe. just in Europe. Yeah. Oh, wow. Which I'm not mistaken, it's something like between 25 and 33 percent of all of Europe. So let's play with let's play with those numbers, right? America has 360 million people. God forbid, imagine you know 120 million Americans die. Not like COVID with all the infections and stuff, but just an actual you know mortality rate. And the mortality rate of this thing, by the way, was upwards of 75 percent. Is this trying to track? The numbers of people who died during that time period or who actually died from the plague or don't we care? No, from the plague. Not just people who died, from the plague itself, who, uh -huh. who are suspected victims of this disease, not just not natural cause deaths. So 75 to 20, 200 million like excess deaths, that would be the COVID terminology, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, point number two. Research from 2017, so recent and 2018, finds evidence of Yersinia pestis. That's the bacterium agent here. Y-E-R-S-I-N-I-A, we'll just call it y pestis from now on. If I didn't hate abbreviations as much as I do, i just call it Y-P. But y pestis in an ancient Swedish tomb that can go back as far as 3000 BC. So talking about waves and cycles and undulations, it's a very, very old kind of thing. Turner, hello. Um, yeah, so, so it, it has been around for a long, long time. Back in people say to the Bronze Age, and there's evidence that this had been around, um, you know, throughout time, coming and going. The uh, Emperor Trajan, speaking of Dante, Dante puts in the second circle of heaven, actually. Um, we talked about the myth, the myth, the story, maybe it's true, of, you know, Pope Gregory the Great, so loving Trajan's um, charity towards the widows and orphans that he asked God to resurrect him so he can baptize him. Trajan is one of these five good emperors. During his reign, there's a, a plague, if you'll think it's his fly pestis. The infamous plague of Justinian, 541 to 542, Y-Pestis, the same bacterial agent. By the way, anyone who's here last class remembers, we talked about the earthquake of Antioch from 526 and the worst year to be alive, 536. Six years later, it's the plague of Justinian. I mean, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things. There's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel to pick disasters throughout history, sadly. God bless all these people who suffered through them. But here, especially this plague of Justinian, Black Plague isn't, isn't just, it's going to peak here. It's most famous, most infamous this time, 1347-50, but it's a long story. And it's curable with antibiotics now. Okay. I believe so, yeah. Some guy, some guy, God bless him. Yeah, still get it, but you can cure it. Well, some guy got it in Colorado. Uh, yeah. it never touch a marmot. Never touch a what? That's today's a marmot. M-A-R-M-O-T. See, you might, okay, you might be... You might be confused, okay, right? Look at, look at this, right? Okay, on the, on, the, on the left, Margo is perhaps the most beautiful feminine name. If you meet Margo, hug her. Margo is great, but do not touch a marmot. And don't be confused. 
Don't touch a marmot thinking that was Margo. Margo is okay to, to shake her hand or hug her um, and congratulate her. If you ever meet someone named Margo, the most, the most beautiful feminine name known to mankind, marmot you shouldn't touch. It's some kind of very cute, very nice yeah. looking animal. It's like a, some kind of like prairie dog, but it's bad and it carries plague. And some guy in Colorado and rabies, yeah. And rabies yeah. Area, but... There you go. Just a lot of bad stuff. Don't, just don't, don't touch animals probably. It's a good rule. Uh, <laughs> there you go that's it I'm, I'm gonna live by that i don't know if that's true but i'm gonna go by that that sounds good enough to me so okay so yeah oh man well this is not good then because i've been feeding this wolf in our neighborhood <laughs> I, I named him i named him i named him wolfie and i've been yeah. I've been like feeding him and playing with him. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. Um, a comedian once talked about a guy in a coffee shop had a husky, and he this comedian convinced his friend that that guy had a wolf. And the guy went and asked the guy, "Do you have a wolf?" And the guy, of course, had the reaction you think he would have, like, "Why would I bring a wolf into a coffee shop? Like, what is wrong with you?" But just avoid all of that, except for Margo. Margo is good, <laughs> but Marmo is mar marmots are not. Now, guys, let's get back on topic again. Wow, I hate you people. You're always getting me off topic. Uh, the Chinese physician Sun Simo, who died in 1652, also mentions in his writings this quote, malignant bubo, B-U-B-O, the kind of, you know, pus-filled, swollen, you know, ball that one was perforated and released this awful smelling pus. Um, you know, God bless these, these poor, poor people who suffered extremely painful, everything, just bad all the way around. It smelled awful. That was the least of your considerations, actually, though, right? How deadly and terrible. And again, we're getting to that in a second. But really quickly, in this class, I tell all my classes this everywhere. I tell the I tell these classes, I tell people at WC this, I tell people this at U of I. I tell people when they beg me to lecture at like Harvard and the Sorbonne, I tell them like wherever I am, I tell them, all of them, um, especially the good one. Uh, <laughs> I tell people always in my class, just learn, learn one thing, learn one thing. These are already really good four things to learn. The Black Plague took place in 1347-1350. A mass variance of fatality, those most fatal uh, pandemics, 75, 200 million people. And then it's very old. These are peaks, and again, peaks and undulations, a wave, a wavelength thing. Like, I wish my brain looked like this at night, those long, like, delta waves or whatever, deep sleep. I have insomnia. Okay. But, yeah. I have a fact in my head that I've been it. there for probably 15 years, and I don't know if it's right or not. Uh, that the black plague is the only time in human history where population actually like known human history that the population actually declined. That's very possible. I, I will never I swear to you as like a personal promise, both like as as your friend and like in this class, whatever scenario, I'll never tell you things I don't know because I don't want to give a misinformation. I don't know if that's true. That's that I would if you if I had to put down a hundred bucks now, I'd go with you. That sounds right to me. I know that at this time it that, that did happen. Like I said, it took a hundred years for the population to um, replenish, so to speak. Um, is it the only time that that's the hundred dollars on the table would be like? Has it ever happened? I don't know, but um, that sounds possibly true because it's so not just in, as Hunter was talking about, it's not just um, Europe. It's all throughout the Mediterranean into Asia. The Russian example I use is the population strictly in Russia, not the rest of the world. Just because Russia is declining, other populations are booming. You're right. I would put up if that hundred dollars was down. I would like you know double up with you. Go all in. Yeah. But that's probably correct. I just don't know if that's true, but that sounds good. And that's a great, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's awesome. That's a very good fact. It seems very probable from what I've seen. I don't, I don't know of anything that was so widely devastating that could be a, you know, a contender for that. Yeah. Also, Russia lost a lot of territory too. So, that oh, yeah. How are you defining, how are you defining what is Russia? Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Awesome. If you're Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Parts of Poland and Poland comes back on the map, right? I mean, so exactly. Is black plague the same thing as bubonic plague? Yes, they are the same thing. Now, there, there are. I don't want to get too scientific and technical. There are like three different, three various strains. At some point, I do not. I am not an epidemiologist. I do not understand the difference scientifically. For our intents purposes, yes, bubonic plague is black plague. Yeah, it's it's it's. I think it's kind of like you know, do I live in the United States of America or? the US or the states. I think it's just it's there's some small difference in the name. It's this why this Yersinia pestis strain of bacterium. 
So we'll talk about I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's most famously, but actually there's another animal that's involved, even more uh, essential. However, guys, so theories about the Black Death, point number five, kind of transitioning now from just time and casualties theories. The scientists in the 1980s challenged the traditional view that, you know, about, about the Black Plague. Challenged the traditional view of the Black Death. Now, now we have some you know, demarcation, some territory to mark out. The Black Plague is the bubonic plague. The Black Death is just this dying event. And they're often synonymously linked that, yeah, the Black Death was dying from the Black Plague. Some people say, oh, was it maybe blah, blah, blah. They finally conclude, quote, plague is plague. No, 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 it's, it is this thing. They, 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 in the 80s, they maybe, and I'm not making fun, or that's what academics do. They try to make a name for themselves. You know, I'm Meg Clark. I'm a pretty well-known blank researcher, but what if I have this breakthrough and I'm, you know, win a Nobel Prize because I'm saying something no one else has said before. So they're trying to, maybe I'll have a new spin. And they say at the end, no, it seems most likely the traditional story is correct. The best example I ever heard of this was uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey were, were either written by Homer or a guy with the same name. So exactly. <laughs> and the point, the point stands. People want to say there can't be these great men, great women in history who did stuff. You know, Shakespeare was done by multiple people. And it's like, dude, shut up. You know, just because you can't do it. You know, it's like, get out of here. And it's like, oh, Homer didn't do it. Well, the works exist. Someone did it, you know. And and, and actually, like, why why would it not? Why can't it be one guy who took, like, an ultimate otium liberale, this, you know, um, which would be an anachronism for Homer's time, but this kind of Roman idea of, like, you know, productive leisure and just do poetry all day. Why not? Why? And it's not like the Iliad and the Odyssey is even that good anyway. It's not hard to do. I don't know, like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, point number six. Point number six. Um, I'm saying Homer is not Virgil. That I am saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Homer's better than Virgil. Homer's better no. than Virgil. Get out of here, Ryan. You're fired from the class. Tell me. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a little break. Ryan, tell me why Homer's better than Virgil and Hunter rebut him with the truth. Why is why do you think Homer's better than Virgil? Well, because I think the heights of this, the human condition is a better uh, exemplified in the Iliad, and I really enjoy Achilles Rage as a theme in terms of it's Achilles really struggling with his mortality when he's destined for de deity and greatness. And instead, he just gets to be some lousy mortal instead of a god like he's supposed to be by prophecy. Uh, I think Virgil is tarnished a little bit by being. Semi-tropical. Are you? Ooh, or how dare exalted. you? How dare you? Well, so, it's a, it's exalted. But, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> the, the Iliad is a very, it's a very, it's a complete tapestry, and the and I, I do think the Odyssey is, is worse than the Iliad, but I think the Iliad is better than uh, the uh, The Odyssey is a little bit too much chat monster of the week stuff going on. I'm gonna make a meme. I'm gonna make a meme of like a professional wrestler body slamming one. I just superimposed in an awkward way, like Virgil and Homer. <laughs> Hunter, why is Virgil better? Can you can you enlighten him, please? So many reasons. Virgil Virgil is just like a lot more Catholic, right? I mean, an ESP, an ESPIS, right? Is his uh, is an ESP's epithet, right? And Virgil was also considered a uh, a prophet, uh, a Catholic prophet by a lot of the people. Because I forget, it wasn't in the other name, but I forget which of his poems he wrote. Something about like the coming of a prince of peace. And he was talking about Augustus, but it was so close to Jesus that sure. um, uh, they thought he was basically a Christian prophet. So, and in my mind, he basically he basically baptizes himself, or, or himself, Aeneas, and the Emperor Augustus in one basically fell swoop. And um, also, the Trojans were like pretty clearly, uh, pretty clearly the heroes, I think. And the chapter didn't even talk about that. Like even in the even in the Iliad, like more people I think identify with the Trojans. Yeah. The Greek. Right on. Because you see a lot of people. That's a fair the point. It's a fair point. With the name Paxar, right? You can go to England, you can go to Peru and you meet people named Hector, but you don't really meet anything like Achilles is. <laughs> Wait, who is who is Hector? I'm just kidding. Um guys, do you have Not any that Hector is really interesting? Do you have any idea though? Like Virgil, right? He wrote the Aeneid. He had six back abs. He played in the NFL and he was a male model. So Homer didn't do any of those things. That's that's my rebuttal for all that. By tradition, he's blind. So, well, I don't know how that factors in yet. 
I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I'll have to come back and comment on that later. I don't know how that factors in right now. Also, yeah, I've also heard of that. We got to have a fight. We got to have like, we got to do something about this. We got to later in this class have a Virgil versus Homer kind of probably freestyle rap battle. That's what I mean. Homer was blind or another guy named Homer. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> Play. I like. I love having these class just because. But like, you always, you always put the, the you always fasten the button. The, we're walking around with a, with a button undone. You always sew it. Yeah, it's exactly right. That's where we're going. So, guys, well, what about now? The, what about transmission theory? So, efficient transmission of Yersinia pestis. Why pestis? This bacteria, right? Becca Schmidt. I'm glad you're like. You're like my pen has been waiting for something to write down finally, and here we go. Efficient transmission of Yersinia pestis is generally thought to occur only through the bites of fleas. Now, this is pretty gross, but I'm going to read it to you. The bites of fleas whose mid-guts became obstructed by replicating Y pestis. So their guts, their stomach was getting like really churned up, like cottage cheese style. You're never going to eat cottage cheese again. There's like lots of cottage cheese of Y pestis bacteria just gurgling up and bubbling. And like, imagine like Orville Redenbacher popcorn, like pop, 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 pop in these fleas stomach, right? After several days... And they want to, guys, they want to clear this blockage. Anyone ever wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, and you go to the bathroom and you like make a noise that will make you like clear your throat and you're like, man, I feel much better. These fleas wanted to do that. They wanted to clear out that blockage of Orville, Orville Redenbacher, first ever, you know, uh, cottage cheese flavored popcorn. They want to get all that out. When they do this, when they finally get this job done, good for them. You got to say, you know, they got it done. Like, Kudos to them. Give credit where credit's due. When they got rid of all this, it's resulted obviously in thousands and thousands of plague bacteria kind of being, you know, put out into the into the ecosystem, so to speak. Now, right, right. Often fleas would directly bite humans and pass on the transmission directly. But as you said, Marie, correctly, the most famous transmission agent, talk about prairie dogs, the aforementioned you know, marmots and stuff, and different types of animals, but really kind of the black rat which in Latin, man, this makes me hate Latin. The black rat, or in Latin, ratus ratus. <laughs> rat rat. <laughs> Double rat. Literally R-A-T-T-U-S space, R-A-T-T-U-S. The only difference is the first R is capitalized. Ratus ratus was originally introduced by uh, Asia to Europe by trade, but was subsequently displaced and succeeded throughout Europe by the bigger brown rat. Bigger, badder, new bad man on the block, alpha brown rat, who has a really cool Latin name too. That's why he probably displaced him. Ratus Norvegicus, the Norwegian rat. That is sick. That's a cool name. I'm not going to lie. Imagine a rap song, <laughs> you know, whoever featuring Norwegian rat. It's yeah, like, it sounds like metal. It could be like metal. Exactly. It just works for a lot of different things. So, so Ratus Norvegicus rat represents the disgustingly named Ratus Ratus. He just destroys him. But the brown rat, um, he introduced something better for the human population. What do you think that is? So ratus ratus, the black rat, gets bit by a flea, infects humans. If he bites them, it's involved in the water supply, whatever. This thing spreads like wildfire. And, and I mean it. As you know, this class is so jovial. We love to joke. This is so sad. God rest his people's souls. It's awful. Um, this part is not funny at all. It's this thing, you know, spread and like kill all these people. The, the ratus ratus, the black rat, is the main transmission agent. What is better about the bigger, badder Norwegian brown rat? Well, what's better for us? He doesn't, yeah, not as prone to transmit the germ-bearing fleas to humans. Okay, so this literally says, I've never thought I would ever read, I never, I never thought I would ever read this sentence in my academic career. Ready? I never thought, Turner, I would ever read this sentence ever in my academic career. You think when I went to grad school, I thought I'd read this sentence? No, I didn't. But here I am. The dynamic complexities of rat ecology. I thought I would never read the dynamic complexities of rat ecology, comma. <laughs> but I have twice now. <laughs> Plus herd immunity and interaction with humans, all of this kind of like, in this sense, a perfect storm leads to, remember earlier, the down the downside. The, the black plague starts dying off when the brown rat replaces the black rat who's more prone to pass along to humans. Plus the people who thank God had survived. Hopefully they had a, a light bout with this awful, awful, impossible to imagine disease or a tough one, but they had immunity, herd immunity spreads, and you see. Again, to the earlier point here, 
I will never tell you stuff that I don't know. I, I'll give you the stamp approval when I say something like, I know this thing. I don't know. I don't think it was. I do not think it was there, but I think it was it, in the water supply, contamination of just, you know, local stuff, especially things like, gosh, the lack of hygienic food preparation, you know, cholera is, is a waterborne disease. I think it was in the, in the water, all those things. I don't think it was airborne, which would have made it, I mean, it, it, literally impossible to evade. There was something here if you, Maybe as well, like myself, I'm completely ignorant on epidemiology, germ transmission. If you're just a person like, oh, uh, a CC is being ravaged by this, I'm just going to stay in this mountainside cave like St. Benedict. You could avoid it. It was not airborne where it would get you to. That is just a whole new level of terror. It's like biowarfare level awful stuff. I don't think it was airborne, but it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be, right? You're, you're eating stuff, the sanitation, the interactions, touching, rats are biting people. It's just, is bad enough as it is you know i do I, I don't i do not think it was airborne but I, I may be wrong maybe there were some strains that were out. i do not know so i don't want to give you false assurances like yes it was or it was not i'm not, I'm not sure does anyone know does anyone know who's airborne or not or i don't really know what's it google that it just seems unlikely that that many people would have been bitten by a rat i mean well no 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 see so the, i think it was transmissible through, through fluids water. and stuff and like even like you know person has a runny nose and hugging some touching someone you know that kind of stuff yeah. eating person you know um body fluids, body fluids prepared it was like sweat and you know hugs people like the, the way common colds right i don't think it was airborne in the way of like if you are on moscow mountain and literally a mile away from all life that it could like float to you that i don't think that could happen right, right. and most people had domestic animals like Exactly. Sure. Which you're touching all the time. Yeah. Exactly. You're going in milking the cow. And yeah, and the rat, rats are right. Yeah, rat. You know, rat excrement everywhere. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like right. I mean, that, that's a theory right now why some of these diseases came up because of because people got domesticated animals. Because like a a, a a parasite doesn't ideally want to kill the host, right? It wants to keep the host alive to live off it as long as it can. Yeah. Right. So uh, an idea I've heard is that. Like hunter gatherers were actually a lot healthier in terms of um, viruses and bacteria because they only got viruses and bacteria that were intended for humans. Whereas when they start getting cow and pigs, they start getting cow and pig diseases and yeah. bigger animals. So what is going to make a cow or a pig sick is maybe going to kill a human being. Yeah, right. No, that's that sounds good to me. Yeah, really, I, I'm serious. Like. Actually, going back to what I said earlier, that I never thought I would read blank as an academic, just being an academic, you do realize how limited your field of knowledge is. I know a little bit about the Black Plague and the social effects, and especially next class. Next class is going to be really fun. I hope all of you come. And yes, that is a shameless pitch. And I'll say every class in next class is so great. Come, of course. I want people to come to my class. But I want to be, it really will be the kind of Catholic response, which is very interesting. What happened? Ria already gave us a taste of that. A great point about how these priests were so brave some of them going to their sure deaths to administer sacraments and you know help their not not flee as the wolves came you could say but to tend their, to their flock and no man has greater love than to lay down his life for his you know his friend so we'll have a lot of that we'll have a lot of cowardice and bad stuff as well i know something about that i know nothing about epidemiology for the hundredth time i have no idea so i mean that didn't stop dr fauci from calling me up and just He's like, do you want to talk about stuff? And I'm I'm like, I'm here for you. You know, we had a nice long conversation. We actually talked about the Washington National for half an hour. And both of us agreed that it'd be better if the Nationals were better at baseball. That's that our conversation. We didn't get really the medical stuff that much. Some crazy percentage of the priests died, right? Yeah, I think of all the social classes, people always think the patterns maybe died from all, but I think priests of all the social classes immediately are at the highest that level. is that is that is to, to be determined yeah no you're right i mean that we'll we'll talk about that real real certain excuse me it is certain but real soon i mean it's not certain yeah yeah and god bless those heroic priests but there's a downside too there's a lot of non-heroic priests whose behavior has also an effect on on people it seems like there's that beautiful prayer from one of these saints and i say one of these saints not in a flippant way but it's one of the saint francis one of these famous saints but it was like if you're if you're you know priest is is a saint your congregation will be holy if your priest is holy your congregation will be good if priest is good your parish will be okay right the, it works both ways if you have a terrible priest everyone's screwed I mean we've seen that in the church how many people have, do you know family or friends who left the church because of scandal acts or wires used yeah priests are marked with indelible mark as the service of the Lord and they 
do a lot of greatness when they when they're the way the way when they're the way they're supposed to be right and holy and all that and when they're bad there's a lot of damage this is the same thing here a lot of heroic priests a lot of not so much we'll get to that next class last point i want to make finally um kind of we talked about so much learn one thing i mean we got a bunch of stuff but here's what does this actually look like what are the symptoms like well marie your earlier point it comes in three forms but for us to keep it as simple as possible not being a kind of science class and we're not worried about that so much it's all the black plague it's all the bubonic plague but it comes in it comes in three forms and brings many signs and symptoms to those affected infected when i read these a lot of you will probably be like oh i have heard this before i know this classic sign was the appearance of these buboes these large inflamed pus filled you know kind of swollen uh you know raised areas in the skin swollen balls kind of like inflamed lymph nodes looking things Periods of buboes in the groin, the neck, armpits, which oozed pus and bled. Most victims, once more, and there's a blanket, you know, for all these people, God rest their soul. Most people died within four to seven days of infection. It had a 75% fatality rate. What was COVID at the worst? Was it like a 0 0.1 or it was like 0.5? I'm not mocking COVID. I got COVID in August 2021. It sucked really mm -hmm. bad. I would say COVID, I am I'm very much a COVID neutralist or balance like you want to wear a mask get every injection go for it like if that's going to help you out of whatever and if you're so like you know government control I, i'm honestly I, I promise i i don't often share my views but like i'm in the middle like i get the people on covid who are like people are trying to just lock everyone down or whatever but i people that are really scared of it like i got like a two out of ten it was fine i was fine it knocked me out for like a month it was awful and by that i mean like i had like probably 12 days of fever and it was pretty bad but a month of just like brain fog. I, God bless people. Have, I, I, I get it. Like if you're a person who's, you know, 65 and it was very tough for you, I understand why you want to wear nine masks. I, I would never mock someone like that. I understand that. Even if the mask, you'll work or not, I just, whatever. But, but orange and tea solution helped me when I got. What is the orange and tea solution? Is that all you did was sit around and eat oranges mm. and drink tea? And I actually, it was very hot. It was about all that. Like, you I have a COVID, I have a COVID orange story. Um, I cried into oranges when I had COVID. I was eating oranges and started weeping because this guy, I told this story in my people lecture back in September 2021. This, I was like getting really angry. I was like, this, I hate this. I'm very much a baby when I'm sick. You know, like I, I don't, I complain. A lot. I'm like, I hate this. This sucks. You know, I'm like, like that kind of person. You know, you know what I mean? There's like the silent sufferers. Would it be frank? I'm kind of obnoxious. Like, why are you? <laughs> why are you okay with this? There's people like me. It's like, by the way, I'm sick. I'm sick. <laughs> you hear me? You know. So I was getting very upset. Like 12 days in, and I told you, like I went into work with my wife. She has a really sick office at WSU. Very cool office. So we're going there this summer. I'm just like complaining to her the entire time. And uh, we, get, like, we get out of the car and there's this like frat guy and his girlfriend. And I was like, what the, like that kind of like, these guys come up to us like, what is this going to be? You know what I mean? This guy is like, so like, brah, you know, that kind of guy, right? But they're like, can we take your photo or something like that? They were just kind of stupid. I don't know what it was. And that promotion for WC, I'm like, yeah, whatever, right? I'm really, really not happy. And uh the guy says out of nowhere it was like a godsend and do i think he's actually my guardian angel no i don't i really i really i really i really hate people i hate people like that i hate people who are like I, i'm gonna talk about like this was probably a sign i don't know if it was a sign or not i don't know i have no idea but definitely yeah, something, yeah. yeah i don't I'm not, I, like i don't know maybe the chances of him actually be my guardian angel zero 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 but if he is if he is then i love that my guardian angel like appeared in bodily forms of a frat guy <laughs> with this like frat, like this sorority girl yeah, that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> this guy was super this guy was like giga chad level and he says but so he, he goes to me out of nowhere he's like oh he's like thanks man he's like I, you know, i'm glad you did that well, he thanked me for the photo he's like i just got over covid he just about himself he's like i just got over covid it was really rough it, but and i got better it's like what it was amazing so I was so grateful to God. I'm eating oranges and I'm like weeping out of tears of joy. So I was crying in oranges. Is that the orange method? Is that count? No, it was, was just you said to drink tea and eat oranges. And that's what I did. I did. I was, well, I was... Well, I, <laughs> yeah. You can say to do things that everybody just needs to do. Frat boys were crying. It was just like, yeah, oranges. I can taste the oranges. 
the tea is soothing. It was like the perfect recipe of what to eat. That should have been what's even worse. That they say that that's why Queen Elizabeth II was so long. That's all she did. She you know, she was just all day long. Paul Mark Zuckerberg explained to him about it. I don't know, but if it shows up on my ad campaigns here shortly, orange tea and menthol. I don't know. They wouldn't feel bad for Princess Margaret. I do. Why? Because she's not as good looking. I think no, it wasn't Princess Margaret like crazy good looking when she was younger. Yeah. yeah, Princess Margaret was like, <laughs> Wow, Clay, tell us how you really feel. Though. Like, like, don't hold back because <laughs> Princess Margaret was so beautiful, and all she wanted to do was to be queen. And you know, like, yeah, but so what? She wanted. I, I'm an American. I say, like, if you have a dream, like, live your dream. Queen of America. Exactly. Yeah. It's better. I read Harry. I read Prince. I read Prince Harry's book, Spare. Oh it was, my gosh. It was really good. You didn't give him money. It was awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. I did it. I didn't read it, but I want. But I want to. I want to read it though. I don't know, guys. Harry, what if he's like? Speaking of Chad's, what if he's like Chad Troll? Oh, like he's like him and Megan are like everything we do, like these Netflix shows will really piss people off. It's hilarious. And they, people just take the bait. Oh, I'm like, dude, these royals, like they, 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 they had everything. And they just like go to, to LA. They won't shut up. They drive me crazy. They're just in there laughing. You know, like that's exactly the reaction I wanted. You know, like I wanted people to get, I don't know. Oh, Meg, Meg Clark, right. Meg Clark. Right. Opinion on Harry and Megan. Do you have one at all? Yes. Well, <laughs> no, no. Well, didn't I, I, I think it's pretty cool. Didn't didn't uh, apparently Prince William punched him out a couple of times. Yeah, I think that that's I think it says really good things about Prince uh, William. Yeah. Mm, I don't know. Well, what yeah. Prince Harry did pop What did King did? Like, if this were like normal, like normal times, normal pre-revolutionary times. You've probably been nice try. I want to know what you think. Of, <laughs> I want to know what you think of Kate Middleton. How regal is Kate Middleton? Getting back to getting back to the black plate. Okay, so yeah, no, really, we've learned really good stuff. Seven points. Here are the signs and symptoms. Okay, and the whole rabbit, um, whatever, what is the rabbit hole we went off on with COVID and oranges and and, and theories was that COVID was awful. Like I can't imagine, like you know. COVID was bad and it's only had like a 0.1 or whatever kind of like mortality rate. It's a 75% mortality rate. Buboes in the groin, the neck, the armpits, ooze, pus, and blood. Most victims die after four to seven days, fever up to 105 degrees. And then the rest of the stuff is kind of the common symptoms of just whatever kind of flu, headaches, painful joints, nausea, and vomiting. But I mean, the boo is the real kind of, that's the real, you know, sig signification of what this was. Okay. So talk about the, what it is. Rats, remember, fleas to black rat, black rat replaced by brown, better for humans, less transmission. Super old story, undulates throughout time. Trajan and the, the plague of Justinian, same thing. Why uh, P, the, this, this bacteria, uh, 75 to 200 million people. Finally, let's get you in Europe, 1347. This is where we'll finish the class okay, of the next couple of pages. We're going to get to the Catholic response next class. As a general rule, you can kind of assume when we have dual lectures, which I think happened only maybe three times this class, maybe more. I know we have a dual lecture for two days of Black Plague, two days of 9-11, two days of Chernobyl. Those are, are lectures that the whole week, most are just one day, even Titanic, which is super insanely famous is one day. But when we have two days, instead of obviously amalgamating facts with Catholic response, we'll divide them. Today we're just going to do all the facts, and then we come in on Wednesday, you know, Bully for You, which is a great store in Colfax. Anyone been to that store? It's a great store. And it's a play on words like good for you. It's a British way of saying you know, whatever. You know, everyone at my flat talks like this. So um, I hate that. I I just hate Britain, period. I hate Britain. Oh, this guy's a genius because he's British. Like, but I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Didn't, yeah, didn't we fight these people and they lost the war because they suck? Like, I'm still thinking we should have. Oh. We should have. Um, no, I seriously speak English with such with such <laughs> uh, 
Okay, guys. We talked about all this stuff, right? Is everyone, is everyone ready for the European facts, Brent Alexander? Plague is first reported in Europe via Genovese traders in the port city of Kaffa in Crimea in 1347. First point, now that you got all the background, and we're going to do no jokes in the next like 10 minutes of pure fact spinning. Genovese traders. Genovese from, from Genoa. Yeah. Genoa. Yeah. Genovese traders who are in Crimea. Crimea is very much in the news now. Crimea, the Crimean, the, the, the you know, the Republic of Crimea, which part of Ukraine annexed by Russia, um, Black Sea, Caucasus region. These Geno Genovese uh, traders are there. They report this, this plague. However, a year prior, a year prior during a protract, uh, protracted siege of, uh, of this city, Kaffa, when it's reported, it's already been swirling around for a year, Mongol golden horde invaders are catapulting infected corpses over the city walls to infect the inhabitants. They're laying siege to the city. And you know, this is, I mean, is, this is not the ancient world anymore. We're not talking about the Battle of Kani in 216 BC in the Second Punic War. This isn't like super old. But they're using old tactics. You lay siege to a city, you want to starve out the population. It's brutal. It's awful. Here's one of the early examples of open knowledge biowarfare. Even if these guys don't understand how germs transmit, they understand these guys died from this awful thing. What if we fling their bodies into the city and then that just messes stuff up? I mean, it can't hurt that kind of attitude, right? And at least it'll be kind of brutal. And it's, it's obviously like from a Catholic perspective, it's horrendous. It's awful. It's disgusting. I can't say what the, the Mongols thought about it. The primary theory, one of the primary theories for disease things at that point that was miasma. Kind of the idea that the night gap and the night had deadly air and that we're rotting bought corpses mm -hmm. would get all the miasma and kind of deadly gas. So it's kind of similar to micro microbial theory, but they knew it was infectious. They, just they knew it was infectious. Like, I think I don't suspect the Mongols thought a different sort of thing, or maybe they were just crazy. No, but yeah, but no, but that I'm agreeing with all of you. I'm saying like it doesn't it doesn't matter if you understand the science. They understood it just like. This guy had this, other people got it, everyone's dead, like fire that at them. Like they just that very simple kind of arithmetic of this, this creates some kind of problem that are not factor you talk about and how the disease is spread. It just spreads to people. So just do this against them. Now, however, as we see again, Genovese traders identifying this in Crimea in the city of Kaffa and then the actual bio warfare antecedent of the year prior, they immediately report that it's taking crazy hold and really spreading because of these infected radis radis, these black rats, who are being flea bitten or perhaps themselves, you know, it's awful, you know, God of mercy, just hellish scene, like gorging on dead corpses who are infected, whatever it is, but getting these diseases, um, they are spreading it throughout the region. Now, as the, the disease take hold, what do the Genovese traders do who are in the Black Sea? What do they do? What would you do? You're there and things are getting pretty haywire. What do you do? Yeah. Right. And therefore, you obviously transmit this. It's, it's a much slower version of get out of Wuhan and you take a plane and whatever, and then you're in Seattle and, and whatever. What happened with COVID, it's a slower, but it's the exact same thing. They retreat, especially to what important hub city? Not a Black Sea city, but think major city, not too far away from this caucus region. It's a city that's going to get its name changed in 100 years. Awesome. Right. Constantinople is you know, Byzantine Rome, the Eastern Sea of the Roman Empire. Okay, at that point, man, everyone is in Constantinople. All the known world, especially the Greek Byz Byzantine world, travels to Constantinople for business, politics, whatever, commerce. So it's going to be arriving in Europe in the summer of 1347. You automatically have knowledge, though. Remember, Black Sea, these traders, rats, biowarfare, now it's in Constantinople, of this Byzantine emperor, John VI, writing a description. And God bless him. And, you know, his son had died from this. His 13-year-old son had died from this. So through grief, as I'm trying to write kind of scientific account that you, you're, he's not doing this from 30,000 feet. Like his, his own family has suffered this tragedy. So the first outbreak in Constantinople in 1347 lasts a year, but it will recur 10 times up until 1400. Over the next 50 years, it's going to come back and back and back and back, depending upon herd immunity, depending upon new people coming in, depending upon, you know, whatever. Um, all right, so we're going to keep this mental picture, right? Remember, we're not doing any nonsense diversions. I don't everyone wants to go off on all their own rabbit holes. We're going to stay on the topic. They are, you know, from Black Sea, Kaffa, biowarfare, rats, into Constantinople. Now we're in Constantinople. It's coming into Europe from these Genoese traders 
from these Genoese traders is going to arrive in Genoa and Venice itself in January of 1348, these Italian cities. But it was the outbreak in Pisa of the obviously, you know, famous Leaning Tower that's the entry point for a larger explosion. And again, this is very recent memory. Remember the maps, like the red, you know, whatever. The, the large outbreak in all of northern Italy. Pretty soon, it's down in Marseille. What is Marseille? Where is Marseille and what is Marseille? Mm -hmm. French port city. There's not one operative word, both are. So both in France, spreading now westward throughout Europe continuously, but also port city. You can please note, star, star highlight, the Black Plague was a port disease. It was a disease ship traders. That was the airplane travel that time that caused this massive propagation of this disease to spread throughout. It reaches Spain by the spring of 1348, summer of 1348 it's in the British Isles already. It's how fast it's moved. Within a year, it's moved from the Caucasus region, the Black Sea, to England. All of Europe is infected within a year. Remember, this will last to about 1350. It's in Scandinavia. It's being reported in 1349 in Norway. And all the way up to northwestern Russia in 1351. Anyone know that northwestern Russia borders Norway? Yeah. Isn't that sick? Like, Norway is over here. Norway does, like, this move. Like, it passes in Finland. Yeah. Russia, yeah. Russia borders Poland and North Korea. Yeah, pretty sick, right? Pretty cool. So it's there as well. Now, according to some epidemiologists, unnamed, so I don't know how much you want to trust them, but periods of unfavorable weather decimated plague-infected rodent populations enforce their fleas onto alternative hosts, and often these outbreaks peak in the hot summers of the Mediterranean. So you can imagine around this Mare Nostrum, this whole Mediterranean idea, not just the European Mediterranean, but what was, you know, Hippo, right? And Algiers and the kind of the African coast. Uh, these are great incubators for disease, as well as the cool autumn months, the southern Baltic region. Among many other culprits of plague contagiousness, what do you think also adds to this massive eventual excess death number? Remember, which is between 75 and 200 million people. In addition to all this, we talked about less than a year, a couple of years from the Caucasus region, even to England, Northwest Russia, it's all throughout. We talked about the symptoms. We got all that down pretty good, I think. What adds to the amount of people that are being lost due to this? Anyone know? Malnutrition, of course, right? Malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Marie, perhaps you're right. Maybe the, I'm serious. Maybe the best way to fight COVID is to do very well, chock full of nutrients, have tons of vitamin C eat a lot of orange juice, be having liquids that are constantly flushing you out, drinking tea. I'm serious, right? Like there's a reason why these grandmother cures of all you're sick, you know, drink, eat chicken soup and drink lots of tea because that does, it, it, it's not a cure-all perhaps, you're not, it's not like that. It's not like Excedrin is a cure-all. And whenever I was splitting headache, take Excedrin, it's gone in like 15 minutes, sweet. Would that other stuff work like that? It doesn't, but it perhaps helps the process. Well, if you can't have, if you don't have access to anything and you're already kind of sickly and weak, perhaps your chances of fighting this off are all the more so. Um, hampered, right? There is variability in region, if anyone cares. I tell all my classes, and I mean this sincerely, I always want to give you 105%, pick your cliche. You can't give more than 100%. Can't give 110%. It's physically impossible, but pick your, I want to give you 137.2%. And kind of like extra stuff, like this isn't so much necessary to know about, I'll just tell you anyways, because it's just, I want you to have all the info and go as deep as you want. You have high mortality rates in Scandinavia, France, Western Germany, Greece, and of course, Central Italy. But at the same time, there is reported uninterrupt uninterrupted agricultural growth in Central and Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, think about Ukraine, breadbasket, and the Iberian Peninsula, and Ireland. Ireland, which will be decimated by the potato famine of 500 years in the future, and which causes that massive Irish immigration to North America, to the United States, makes Boston... As, as, as obnoxious as it is now, um, Ireland is not that affected at this time, thankfully. Okay, so. Is that because they don't have ports? Because you're talking about areas that are more interior? This is the theme of today's class, is my ignorance. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Ireland is like stronger. I don't know. There, there, there might, there might, there. <laughs> People don't people don't want to talk about biological determinism, use like eugenic terms and stuff, but maybe some people are hard here. I don't know. That that could be a thing. Ireland definitely has ports. Ireland's an island, right? So it has to have some access. 
Although Ireland sadly really was so abused by the British Empire that it's like maybe they're also like, oh, you know, filling your favorite expletive, you guys, we're not gonna get and they just they're ignored and, and here it's a good way, right? There's not many people like tending to them, they're left on their own. Well, um Eastern and Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and Ireland are also not urban, nearly as urban. Yeah, as urban density. France. Um, they're, they're, it's, well, I don't know about the but, but no, but, but, but thank you. Cities, yes, there are cities like Prague. I don't know. Yeah. 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 So, but I no, but thank you. Urbite and urban cities like well. Oh, yeah, I. I agree with you. I am like on that train 100% with you. Like asking you, can I please be the conductor to pull the whistle harder? I think that's exactly correct. I think ports are a huge thing, but yes, no, urban density matters. Yes, Prague is already a large city at that time. And you have like Krakow and Poland. There are cities there, but like Ireland, especially even like today, even today, Ireland is Dublin and nothing, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the charm of Ireland. People who like are obsessed with Ireland, it's the most beautiful place in the world. Oh, old Aaron, you know, and blah, whatever, and green, that kind of stuff. And like, they actually, like, I've heard people say there, there are actual leprechauns in Ireland, mm -hmm. but it's just a short guy named Sean and his mates. <laughs> yeah. You know, that passes for leprechauns. Can they get after some Guinness? You bet your bottom dollar. Dublin is very dense. Other places are not, right? Right, right now, Xander's correct. You know, there is something here to be said about communal water supplies, public sanitation, which is awful. We're going to talk about in this class, actually very shortly about the cholera outbreak in, in London in 1852, 1860, a couple of cholera, which is a horrible waterborne disease that leads to massive improvements in sanitation in London. Well, that's not around in the 1300s. That's going to be problematic. Speaking of, before I get too far ahead of myself, right, I want to get too far of myself really quickly. We're almost done. We're almost this beautiful stopping point before we talk about the Catholic response to all next class. There's no class next Monday. I'm understanding that, right? Because it's labor day, I don't know what that means. But uh, <laughs> there's really no. Can you, what is labor day? Someone talked about labor day. Labor. <laughs> oh, is that what it's called? It's labor. Oh, I, I, I mean, I, when I see it spelled the British way, I think it should be pronounced labor. What is labor day? What is that? I've never heard of that. It's off apparently. I mean, I don't know. So we're not going to be here for that. Um, all of you who are looking at me like, do you not know what labor day is? Thank you for kind of like, thank you for playing along. Because of Labor Day next week, yeah, we're not having class, but I'm going to still make a video for you. I told you, just attach the Maple Syrup History YouTube channel because I want to keep going. I respect your time so much and my own. I don't want to get behind. So do not think, oh, because we're not here on Monday, we'll do when we're going to be back in class. No, no, no. Anytime you have to miss for a reason, I'll just make a virtual video. What's the topic? The topic that week, I think, is like 17th century famine, so I'm not mistaken. It's on the syllabus. I am not, I would never say, this is so disrespectful. Oh, trip the syllabus. Like, in that kind of pretentious school marmish high school way. I'm, I'm not, I'm saying that, no, actually check the syllabus. I'm not 100% sure. It's whatever it is. I think it's 17th century panels, okay. um, which will just be a video. And when we come back, I believe that Wednesday we do cholera because we get to modernity very fast in this class. We were in sixth century last week. We're in the 14th now. Within two weeks, we're talking about the Galveston hurricane of 1900 in, in, in Texas and the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. So we get to, we get to the 20th century kind of very quickly and don't leave. The whole semester you know i mean the, the last class is 9 11 and then covid i think they're only topics the on the entire class like 75 percent probably is the 20th century disaster um okay so really quickly guys more stats because there's these stats and maybe this would be a good prod to pray for these people later on you know in your, your prayers for the dead some people say 45 to 50 percent of the european population died of the plague i only heard every you know, 25 or 30 some guy, Ole Benedict Goff, now he's Norwegian, so keep that in mind, but he says it was 60%. You never can trust what a Norwegian says. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. <laughs> I learned that the hard way in Norwegian casino, believe me. Um, I did it. That's completely fake, but this is true. Norwegian historian Ole Benedict Goff, <laughs> that guy, I like that he felt that. Like, did he really, did he really like, learn the hard way about Norwegian? I know, Becca, no, I've never even been to Norway. I would like to go, though. He says it might be as high as 60%. That is, that is heroin. That is awful. It's three fifths. So if there was, you know, 5 million people in Europe, 3 million would die at 60%. That's crazy. To play with that number for us today, remember 350 million Americans, we'd be like 200 million Americans dying. Do you think that would have an impact in the country? Am I going to finish that sentence? Obviously, it's a rhetorical question. It's like, right? Devastating. Here's city numbers, right? Alexander, you're... You always 
come up, you know, pretty strong in this class. Like you, things you say usually age well. They're always, almost always just perfectly true. But here's what I'm saying where I think you're exactly right. Listen to this. Ryan Alexander talked about crowded cities. In crowded cities, it was not uncommon for as much as 50% of the population to die. Half of Paris's population of 100,000 people died. In Italy, the population of Florence, your question about you know, repopulation, how long it took. In Florence, it was reduced from between 110 to 120,000 inhabitants in 1338 to 50,000 people in 1351. That's more than half. 60% of the population of Hamburg and Bremen um, perished. Florence tax records suggest that 80% of the city's population died within four months in 1348. So at the height of this, if you know anything about the, we'll talk about the Spanish flu, the real bad wave, I believe, is the second wave in November of 1918. And it's in this most awful wave, it's four months, almost everyone in Florence dies. Four out of five people die, 80%. Before 1350, Clay, this is a quote for you. Before 1350, there were about 170,000 settlements in Germany. A hundred years later, there was 40,000. So a hundred years later, the amount of settlements in Germany have been reduced by, you know, 75%. This is just unbelievable nuclear bomb. In fact, pun intended, it would take like nuclear warfare to bring about these numbers today, like population reduction. May God forbid it in his mercy. Okay, um, and you have, we talked about earlier hunters for you now about how this went beyond Europe. In Cairo, Egypt, the population is about as many as six, 600,000 people, which is possibly the largest city in, in the whole Middle East region, certainly the largest city outside of China. Um, about 40% of the inhabitants died within eight months of this stress. So this is a worldwide COVID-like phenomenon that wrecks havoc. Now, do you want to hear the good news? I have the last two quotes to read to you. Do you want to hear good news first or bad news first? Bad news first. Okay. So yeah, so finish on a high note. So bad news is that, here we go. This is uh, Angelo Di Tura. He records his experience from Siena. Right now, I'm going to read this all in Italian just for you. Okay? Italian. Certo, certo. No, I, I don't know if I, I, my Italian is not good enough to translate this immediately from English. I'm just going to get really angry and not read it. Just, you know, be mad that it's not. Here's what he said verbatim. Ready? This is awful. This is sad. Quote, father abandoned child, wife, husband, one brother, another. For this illness seemed to strike through the breath and sight, and so they died, and no one could be found to bury the dead for money or friendship. Members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could without priests, without divine offices. Great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of dead, and they died by the hundreds, both day and night. So we talk often about, in fact, my next academic book is going to be about World War I, the Great War on the Palouse, how modernity is born in the trenches of the First World War, where you have this mass dehumanization, mass graves. Maybe it's not World War I, it's the Black Plague so many years earlier. People buried in a pit, in kind of flaming pits in the center of a city. Awful. Here's good news, though. Last point about these heroes. Quote, monks, nuns, and priests were especially hard hit since they cared for people with such fervor during the Black Death. So thank you. Bringing kind of full circle, Marie, your point about a lot of the heroes and heroines of our faith, the people in consecrated life who really did lay down their life out of love for their brother. Dominic, do you have your hand up? That's someone had no, okay. So that's it for me. Now it's time to be free. Go for it. I'm thinking Bubo and Boo Boo are like out of the Maybe, that's yeah. That's more of the police there. No, no, yeah, I'm time out. Yeah, mommy, mommy, I bang my elbow. Do you have a boo boo? Do you want a band aid? Yeah. It's possible. In fact, a boo boo, think about a kid getting a boo boo in that colloquial sense, is a raised kind of like bump, right? I mean, I'm, there might be something from that. There's a lot of stuff, like, I, again, from World War One, like, uh, I feel lousy is a kind of like old person thing to say. By old person, I mean no one in this room. I mean someone born like in 1900, so a dead person thing to say. Like lousy was big in like the 1930s. Right. From Laos. It means from being infected by lice in a trench. World War One trench coat comes from world. So so yeah, I'm sure Ryan Alexander's point um, is probably true that these words take on these meanings. We don't even know what their etymological significance or origin is. But they really come from these things. Guys, it is an absolute pleasure. I see a lot of people not here, so I don't see people that should be here, starting with your parents. Ooh, that is not good enough. That is not. I'm going to sing a song. Go ahead, yeah. 
they have possibly contributed to the spread of the of course it did of course it did of course it did yeah they cremated in in metropolitan areas well so you cremate you rid yourself of of you know a lot of the bearing of the disease so if they have been cremating in yeah. Not area, perhaps it was in the right. And they didn't because it was because of that. They just misunderstanding of the dollars. That's why they stopped. You know? So, on that note, you know, and thank you really, but like that's a great note to end on of like, okay, this is where we are at this kind of real depressed point of looking at all this ravaging thing. Next class, just the Catholic response. I'll see you all then. Thank you for sure. all the stuff. Uh, until next time. I don't. I'm just kidding. All right, see you around. I yeah, yeah it's, I'm actually glad in meeting. Yeah, I love the UK. I, I have a, like a special rule. I will only kid when I love. I would never say I hate something if I really do hate it. No, UK is great. UK is. Awesome.